Sometimes a friend or a passerby witnessing my absorption with fishing and mistaking it for contentment ask if they too could take it up and so find escape and ease. We fishermen are accustomed to this question and know that it would be better to pretend not to have heard or understood it. There is no simple, sensible answer. We could be cautionary and talk of it as an unshakable addiction, a never-ending quest for an unholy grail, but this would be too gloomy. We could talk of the delights of seclusion with nature, but this would be too glib, and leaves out what Arthur Ransom calls elsewhere the fourth dimension. The world in which it is easy enough to enter, but which we fishermen find it very hard to leave. It is impossible to explain, but Arthur Ransom describes its grip in his essay on carp. who fishes habitually for carp has a strange look in his eyes. I've met several, I've even shaken hands respectfully with the man who caught the biggest carp ever to be landed in England. He looked as if he'd been in heaven and hell and had no more to hope from life, but uh, he survived and six years later caught an 18 pounder to put beside the first. The carp fishing combines enforced placidity with extreme excitement. You may, day after day, for weeks, Watch your rod fishing on your behalf, for you do not hold it in your hand. And then, at last, you see your float dip and move off, and striking with proper delay, are suddenly connected fastest fish that swims. A salmon keeps it up longer, and I doubt if even he has the carp's pace. Carp are immensely strong. To hold them safely, you need stout gut, but to use stout gut is to let them see it and to throw away most chances of having a carp to hold. Come along in there. Come along in there, 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 He's off. He's away. He's away, he's away, he's away. <laughs> Well then, that was all right. That was all right. There are carp to be caught, after all. 
The cart's speed, size and momentum are enhanced in their effect upon the mind by the stillness of the ponds in which they are to be found. The pleasantest of such places I know is the lake in front of a tower that Cromwell burnt. A placid pool where frogs spawn in spring and where ancient trees stand on the still more ancient dam that holds it up. These trees have, during the storms of several centuries, dropped branch after branch into the lake, and the bottom there is rich with decaying leaves and fortresses for fish. You cast out and pray, one, that you may not hook an oak bough, and two, that if you hook a carp, he may neglect the snags on either side of him and give you just a slightly better chance of catching him by burying himself in the water lilies in the middle of the lake. You cast out, I say. Alas, there is no longer anything to cast for. The lake was drained for fish during the war and the men who took them took even the fingerlings and left nothing alive that they could see. The carp in that lake, however, did not run very large. There were a few big ones killed when it was drained, but nothing of the size I saw at the weekend in a duck pond that could scarcely have covered two acres. This pond was square and used for washing sheep. There was a little wooded island in it and a sunken willow tree. Its banks were almost without bushes. It was simply a shallow bathtub of a pond. It had not even water lilies. It looked as if it had no fish. When I came to the pond side, I believed I'd been misled and was consoled by watching a flock of wild Canada geese resting beside it. For several minutes, they took no notice of me, and then altogether, 12 or 13 of them, stretched their long black necks and a moment later rose into the air, cleared the hedge, and lifting slowly, flew away. I was still watching them when I heard something like a cartwheel fall into the pond. Huge rings showed, even on the windswept surface. I watched for a particularly clumsy diving bird to come up again. None came. But just as a gleam of sunshine opened the racing clouds, there was another vast splash, and a huge, pale gold fish rose into the air, shook himself in a cloud of spray, gilded by the sunshine and his own colour in the midst of it, and fell heavily back into the water. In a few minutes after that, the rods were up and the baits cast out. The floats cocked on the surface by the shotted line. 